be some other name. What's in a name? That which we call a rose by any other name would smell as sweet. Oh, hi. I just got a crash course in classic literature to prepare for today's episode, and that was a passage from my pal, Billy Shakespeare. Now, Billy was in love with a gal named uh, Jules Verne, but tragically, Jules was in a completely different baseball league 20,000 miles away near the Sea of Cortez. Undeterred, Billy decided to float a raft down the Mississippi in a desperate attempt to reach his true love and to watch her play in the All-Star Lovers Baseball game. But the catcher was deep in a field of ryegrass at the time, so the team lost and neither of them made it into the 1984 Hall of Fame. Shoo, now that is some deep stuff. But enough about poetry. I invite you now to this very special scientific episode of EMU Plant Pals, where we investigate the basics of plant nomenclature. You know, a lot of people send me a picture and they ask me, Brent, what's the name of this plant? And I say, I don't know, did you bother asking it? Maybe it likes to be called Bob, or Mary Sue, or Mary Sue Bob. <laughs> of course, that's not what they mean. They're actually talking about the common name or the scientific name. There's a word for the naming and classifying of organisms, and that's called taxonomy. Common names, of course, are the ones most familiar to us. Here we have the jade plant, the peace lily, and the spider plant. Quite often, a common name has something to do with its physical appearance, characteristics, economical, or historical value. For example, the bird of paradise plant looks like the bird of paradise bird. Uh, no, not like that. There, that's more like it. And this good looking plant pal is called horsetail because some folks think it looks like a horse's tail. But the plant also contains coarse fibers and silica. Pioneers would use it to clean their pots and pans, lending to its other common name, scouring rush. Common names can be confusing though because some plants have multiple common names just like the horsetail we just mentioned. And furthermore, different folks from all over the world can have the same common name for completely different plants. For instance, this is a gooseberry in Europe and North America, but in South America this unrelated species is a gooseberry. Those in South Asia might call this a gooseberry, and in South Africa this succulent plant doesn't produce berries at all, but is sometimes called gooseberry due to the resemblance of its fleshy leaves. The other potential problem with common names is that they can suggest the wrong family relationships. Quite common around the EMU campus are trees such as the eastern red cedar and the tulip poplar. However, eastern red cedars are not true cedars at all. Instead, they're more closely related to the junipers. And tulip poplars are neither tulips nor poplars. These plants are more closely related to the magnolias. These inconsistencies led to the scientific classification we now use today. The naming system is standardized and consists of a Latinized genus and specific epithet that is known all over the world. For example, you would know that the red cedar is more closely related to the junipers by its scientific name Juniperus virginiana. Now hold up, what's that little L doing up there? Well, every scientific name includes the name or the initials of the one who authored it, and in this case that would be Carl Linnaeus. That's me! Linnaeus was an 18th century Swedish naturalist and is known as the father of modern taxonomy because he developed and popularized the binomial system. Before these two-part names were widely adopted, scientific names often comprised of long Latin phrases describing the plant and those names varied from botanist to botanist. For example, Linnaeus named mountain laurel Calmia latifolia, but our very own Virginia botanist John Clayton would have called the plant Andromeda folius ovatus obtusus, Corollis corymbosus infundibuliformibus, genitalibus declinatus. Yikes! Thank goodness for cue cards, and thank goodness for Carl Linnaeus. <laughs> Modern taxonomy is not without its complications today, though. Even with this standardized system, 
Scientists are always reclassifying organisms based on new research and evidence. This plant pal is known as Diphasiastrum digitatum, but the authorship suggests a recent name change. In 1741, a German botanist named Johann Delenius called the plant Lycopodium digitatum folius arboris vitae, Spicis bigamellus teridibus. In 1848, a modern binomial was given to the plant by another German botanist named Alexander Braun. Unfortunately, the new name Lycopodium digitatum was improperly published and therefore rejected by 20th century botanists. In 1901, American botanist Merritt Fernald said the plant was a variety of a different species, Lycopodium complinatum. Then in 1913, William Blanchard promoted this variety to species level, calling it Lycopodium flabelliform. But still unsatisfied in giving credit to its earliest authors, Czech botanist Joseph Holub renamed the plant Diphasiastrum digitatum. The Dill X. A. Braun means that a proper name was first published by Delenius and then by Braun. Having both of these authors in parentheses, though, means that the presently accepted name is now the one published by Holub. And although this is the most up-to-date version, some publishers today still prefer the older name Lycopodium digitatum while treating the others as synonyms. It can get a little hairy sometimes, so feel free to call this plant by its common names, fan club moss, running ground cedar, or crow's foot. But just so you know, it's not a moss, it's not a cedar, and it sure as heck is not a crow. So, what's in a name? Well, I'll leave that for you to decide. I hope you found this episode informative, and I look forward to seeing you all again real soon.